Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 2. In the last video, we took a broad look at the way we perform experiments in absorption and emission spectroscopy. One of the things we saw is that both of these forms of spectroscopy involve exciting electrons to a higher electronic energy level, or observing the photons emitted when an electron drops out of such an excited state. For this reason, it'll be interesting to think about what can happen while electrons are in those excited energy states, even if they're only there very briefly. First, we should remind ourselves that this is not a realistic picture of what the energy levels look like. For example, back in video 11, we saw that these electronic energy levels shouldn't be visualized as being flat horizontal lines. Instead, for a system containing a vibrating bond, each of these levels has a potential energy profile that's better depicted using a harmonic oscillator model, which looks like this. In case you've forgotten, the black parabola represents the potential energy of the system for a range of separations between the two nuclei and the bond. The horizontal lines represent the vibrational energy levels belonging to this particular electronic state. As you might recall from video 11, these curves are the square of the wave function and therefore represent the probability that a system in that vibrational level will have the bond length described by the x-axis. These curves will be important for our discussion later in this video, so it's worth spending some time reviewing what they're telling us. As you can see, the probability curves show us that in the ground vibrational state, the system is most likely to have a bond length near the center of the plot, above the bottom of the parabola. However, for excited vibrational states, the bond length is more likely to be at the extreme ends of the parabola, either where the bond is compressed to a shorter length or stretched to a longer length. But as you might remember from video 13, even this isn't a very accurate picture of what an electronic energy level looks like. That's because a real bond will break if we stretch it enough. That means that as we stretch a bond, the energy increases until the nuclei are so far apart that they no longer repel or attract each other. At that point, the bond is broken, and further separating them doesn't raise or lower the energy. As you might remember from that video, this model is known as an anharmonic oscillator, and the potential energy curve we get is called a Morse potential. This is a much more realistic picture of an electronic energy level, but even this has some features that make it only an approximate depiction. However, this is an accurate enough model for the rest of our discussion. So now, with this picture of an electronic state in mind, let's think about what will happen when a system absorbs or emits a photon. Suppose we look at two electronic energy levels of a system. The lower curve is the ground electronic state, and the upper one is an excited state. First, notice the positions of the curves with respect to the x-axis. The bottom of each curve has a different position in the x-dimension. That reflects the fact that the equilibrium bond length may be different for the two electronic states. In this example, the excited state has a longer bond length than the ground state. This is often the case, but the rest of our discussion would still be true if the bond is shorter in the excited state. Now, imagine that the molecule is in the lower electronic state, and it absorbs a photon. It's most likely that the system would start in the ground vibrational state, too. And as we just saw, the most probable bond length for a molecule in the vibrational ground state is here, above the lowest point of the potential curve. Now imagine that the molecule absorbs a photon, which means that the electron will be raised to the excited electronic state. Back in video 27, we talked about the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, which tells us that nuclei are so much heavier than electrons that, compared to the electrons, the nuclei are nearly stationary. How does that affect the system when it absorbs a photon? Well, it turns out that when a molecule absorbs a photon, the affected electron is excited to a higher energy level quickly, really quickly. In fact, it's so fast that no one has ever been able to measure the time it takes for an electron to change energy levels. 
That means it must take less than one femtosecond, which is a quadrillionth of a second. The Born-Oppenheimer approximation tells us that, in that amount of time, the nuclei are essentially motionless. That means that the bond length will still be the same when the electron reaches the excited state. On this plot, that means the electron moves in a vertical direction and reaches a point on the excited state potential curve directly above the place where it started. This idea that the bond length doesn't change in the time it takes for an electron to move from one electronic energy level to another, is called the Frank Condon principle. And the change that the electron makes as it moves is known as a vertical transition. The Frank Condon principle is named after its discoverers, the German physicist James Frank and the American physicist Edward Condon. Frank is one of many scientists who came to the United States during the years before World War II. Frank was Jewish, and when Nazis came to power, he knew that his career and his life were in danger, despite the fact that he had already received the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1925. For that reason, he came to the U.S. to work at Johns Hopkins University, and then the University of Chicago. His salary there allowed him the financial support he needed to bring his daughters, his aunt, and his elderly mother to the U.S. from Germany, too. Meanwhile, Edward Condon's life was also very eventful. He was one of the scientists who worked on the Manhattan Project, which developed the atomic bomb. However, he resigned from the project because he found the extreme security precautions surrounding the project disturbing and heavy-handed. Because of that, and because after the war he argued strongly that control of nuclear policy should be in civilian and scientific hands instead of the military, he was singled out by the House Un-American Activities Commission, who believed that many civilians, including scientists, were loyal to the Communist Party, which in most cases, including Condon's, was very untrue. Anyway, notice that in this example, the electron is not in the ground vibrational state when it arrives at the upper electronic energy curve. That's often the case. Although the electron was in the ground vibrational level on the lower curve, there's no guarantee that this will be the case on the upper electronic curve. So, what happens now that the system is in the electronic excited state? Well, if the system stays in that state for any appreciable time, the nuclei will have time to move, so the bond will vibrate. As we saw a few moments ago, the most likely length for a bond when it's in an excited vibrational state is at either end of the horizontal line representing the vibrational state. So, those are the two most likely bond lengths if the electron drops back to the ground electronic state. If the bond length is the one over here on the left side of the curve, then the molecule drops back to the ground vibrational state on the lower curve, which is exactly where we started. Remember, the Frank Condom principle still applies, so the bond length doesn't change while the system drops to the lower curve, and we make a vertical transition in this picture. However, notice what happens if the bond is elongated over here when the system returns to the ground electronic state. In that case, the system will make a vertical transition to this point. But notice that the energy here is higher than the energy of the ground vibrational state. That means the system will be in an excited vibrational state in the lower curve. So, the system will lose different amounts of energy when it drops out of the excited state, depending on which side of the curve the system happens to be on. Since the amount of energy lost depends on the difference in height between the two levels, this means a change from the upper electronic state to the lower one can result in more than one peak in a spectrum. There's one other thing to notice. Suppose the curves have these relative positions. In that case, when the system absorbs energy and makes a vertical transition to the upper curve, it will end up here, in a higher vibrationally excited state than last time. Just as before, the bond will now stretch. 
However, notice that this time, the energy of the vibrational state is higher than the height of the right side of the curve. That means that the system will move to the right until the distance between the nuclei is so great that the bond breaks. This broken bond means that a chemical change has happened in the molecule. That's one reason that light can cause a chemical reaction, like photodecomposition. So, as we saw, a system in an excited electronic state will eventually return to the ground state. How does that occur? It turns out that there are several ways the system can return to the ground state. First, the molecules can lose energy by colliding with other molecules, which transfers some of the excess potential energy into translational energy of the molecules. As a result, over the course of several collisions, the molecule can drop to lower vibrational or electronic states without emitting any photons. Another way for the system to get to the lower electronic energy level is for some of the electronic energy to be converted to vibrational energy without the need for collisions to occur. Here's how it works. Suppose this is how the two electronic energy levels are positioned relative to each other. Now suppose that the system is in this vibrational energy level on the upper curve, so the system is most likely to have a bond length at either end of this horizontal line. Now imagine that these are the vibrational levels of the lower electronic state. Notice that one of those vibrational levels coincides in energy to the vibrational level where the system is. In this situation, the system can simply move to a vibrational level that belongs to the lower curve without actually changing the overall energy of the molecule. The bond will now vibrate on this other vibrational level. This process is known as internal conversion. Another possibility is that the molecule will emit a photon with an energy exactly corresponding to the difference between the upper and lower curves. Remember, this can happen from either end of the upper vibrational level, so the emitted photon could have more than one possible energy. For this reason, an emission spectrum can have more than one peak resulting from a transition from the same vibrational level on the upper curve. If the excited and ground electronic levels are both singlet states, then this emission of photons is called fluorescence. We haven't talked too much about singlet states and other excited states like triplets, but that'll come in the next video. You've probably seen fluorescence before. Some dyes, like fluorescein, seem to glow slightly in room light. That's an example of fluorescence. Also, you may have realized that certain minerals and dyes glow under a UV light. That's another example of fluorescence. However, glow sticks and paints that give off light in a darkened room are not fluorescence, but are instead an example of a different phenomenon called phosphorescence. What's the difference? That's what we'll talk about next. It's a different way that a system can drop back from an excited state back to the ground state. Here's how it works. Let's look at another system in which the excited and ground states are both singlets. Molecules have more than one excited electronic state, though, so let's draw another one of them, like this. However, suppose this excited state isn't a singlet, but is instead a triplet state. Notice that the two excited state potential curves overlap. Because of that, it's possible for the system to change its multiplicity, moving from the singlet state to the triplet state without losing energy. That's a process called intersystem crossing. So, now the system is in a vibrational level on the triplet excited state. Just as in fluorescence, the system can emit a photon to drop back down to the lower electronic state. But there's a problem this time. It turns out that a system can only emit a photon to return to the lower state if the upper and lower electronic states have the same multiplicity. In other words, the system can only emit a photon to return to a singlet ground state if the excited state is also a singlet. 
If the excited state is a triplet, the system should not be able to emit a photon to get back to the ground state. We say that such a transition from a triplet to a singlet state is forbidden. However, that's really only an approximation. In reality, transitions between the triplet and singlet states are possible, just very unlikely. For that reason, the system is likely to stay in the triplet state for a pretty long time before it drops down to the singlet state. That's why a material that glows in the dark will keep glowing for minutes or hours. The excited state is a triplet, and for that reason the molecules can only emit light and return to the ground state very slowly. This is what's known as phosphorescence. On the other hand, fluorescence involves an excited and ground state that are both singlets, so the emission of light between them happens very quickly. For that reason, fluorescence essentially stops once we take away the light source that we're using to excite the molecules. So let's take a last look at the timescales of all the different processes we've talked about today. The excitation of a system from the ground electronic state to an excited state is very fast, less than 10 to the negative 15 seconds. If the system returns to the ground state via collision, that takes about 10 to the minus 8 seconds if it's in the gas phase, or between 10 to the minus 14 and 10 to the minus 12 seconds if it's a liquid. It makes sense that the time scale is so much smaller for the liquid phase, because molecules are much closer together in a liquid than in a gas, so collisions happen more often in the liquid. If the system returns to the ground state through internal conversion, that takes about 10 to the minus 14 to 10 to the minus 9 seconds. Finally, fluorescence takes about 10 to the minus 9 seconds, and phosphorescence can take from 10 to the minus 3 seconds all the way up to several hours. Well, that's enough new material for now. In the next video, we'll look more at the different kinds of electronic states, including singlets and triplets, and we'll see what exactly those mean and how to identify them. I hope you'll join me for that. But until next time, have a good week.